Where should we begin? Let's begin it right here. And this is going to be the annotated. The Exodus is black Israel's story. Is black people's story. This will be the second part of this particular um, mini-series right here. This is from Exodus Decoded, the James Cameron and uh, Simcha Jacobovitsky's production right here. If you want to get a copy of it, doc videos, or you can check it out on the probably YouTubes. Let's play it from here. The ultimate archaeological mystery. Okay, now that's this is something we can learn from here. Tracking down experts or expert research or documentation from various fields, and you'll find that people have their favorite um, master teachers or their favorite um, teachers on ancient Egypt or Egyptology, especially amongst us as generally speaking. Um, black peoples. We here in the diaspora, we here in the wilderness of North America. So we have Ari, we have Dr. Ben, um, John Henry Clark, uh, Sheikh Anta Diops, and, and a variety of other scholars, past, present, and even future scholars in the making. And here's an era that happens even in the European institutionalized uh, scholasticism. And that era is that many make discoveries or have important evidence, but what happens is that everyone's playing the favorites and not looking for the truth, but looking for a kind of a fan club, you know, like, you know, they're Justin Beaver of scholarship. Like one would say, I like Sarah Sutinsetti, or I like Ali, I like Sarnetta, I like this one, I like that one, you know, and that just helps to serve the down presses of our people. Ultimately, Satan, the devil, the hyperdimensional um, um, being, um, which is neither black or white, but uses the expert black and white of the Freemasonic checkerboard. So we have to really look at not just the black and the white, but also the gray areas. So this is one of the gray areas of scholarship. And just to note this particular book once again, Dick Gregory's, I think this is probably one of his, his best and most classic um, works right here, Dick Gregory's Bible Tales with commentary edited by James R. McGraw. And I think this is an excellent um, Bible study for children, you know, Bible school, right? Or Bible studies for, for I and I people. So I'm highly recommending this for those who are working on the children's books to get a copy of this. And we'll try to make, if you got a PDF of this, that can be a read, you know, read only copy that can be made available. Please do so. It's kind of rare and it really needs to be published again. And hopefully in talking about it, Perhaps the author, perhaps Dick Gregory, you know, will make this available or even expand on this particular work. This is a very excellent work that was um, written um, and somehow forgotten. We came across a copy of it. And I would say this is one of the seminal works that we read years ago in the late 80s, early 90s, which really caused me to look at the Bible in a new and a living way and to recognize that a lot of the whitewashing of the Bible has really blinded our minds. Even when one's become awake or snoozing, snoozing and awake in consciousness, you know, to the fact that the Egyptians are black and Egypt is in Africa, you know, they take that as though that is the gospel. That's not the gospel. That's just the realization of the lies but we get caught and we get stuck on that. Like we're still arguing with imaginary um, ghosts of a white supremacist past instead of building and tilling, rising and shining and overcoming in the teaching of the King of Kings and the Black Christ, our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christos, Yeshua HaMoshiach. So the variety of disciplines, experts that don't really agree with each other, right? That don't talk rather to each other. But if we look at their writings and compare and looking for the truth, keeping the truth as our prime directive and not getting caught up on personality. So it's not really about personality, even some personalities that we might have to um, rebuke or debunk the present, you know, scholarship and certain ones out there that might be your favorites because you like how they kick it, so forth and so on. But the truth is our prime directive. So let's continue from here. Remember, this is the annotated version. So we're going to stop, pause and make some commentaries. And those who can put transcripts of what we're saying, please do so and post it appropriately at Rastafari Foundation or other other networking sites out there where we can share or blog about it. All right. So what a feat. None of them fully subscribes to our take on the story. But many Pause. That's another thing. None of them fully subscribe to I and I Rastafari and in a Wendem Yad and Ras Yadinos Tefari, Ras Ayadonis Tefari. They don't subscribe to the line of Judah Society's um, interpretation of it. But the key is based on the evidence and not just picking and choosing, but if evidence is certainly evidence, what is your interpretation of this evidence? Not dismissing evidence and choosing certain low-hanging fruit and misrepresenting this evidence to a lot of the brothers and sisters out there who are really trying to find out what the truth is. As critical pieces of the puzzle, what emerges will challenge even the most skeptical. Now, this is what we want to do as well. A lot of people are skeptical of what we're preaching and we're teaching, but the challenge is bring forth your evidence, right? Bring forth your evidence. In, in fact, this is the area I wanted to touch on right here. Let me just put this in, in this version right here of the recording. Um, evidence. There's, there's, there's evidence in the Bible. There's a verse that I want to share with you, right? And this verse right here, uh, I want you to take this down, to write this down, evidence right here. I think it's in Jeremiah, where it says, um, um, let's see, okay, take these evidences, this evidence, okay, evidence, evidence, where it says to present, yeah, present your evidence, or just acknowledge that is that it is the truth. Right? Either present your evidence. If you say, well, this is not the right evidence, then present your evidence or acknowledge that it's the truth because the night is far spent, the day is at hand. So let us put off the unfruitful works of darkness, of ignorance. Right? Don't think when we say darkness, we're speaking about blackness because that's being Gentile minded. You, know, you see, we have to confront that. You know, because like we're still arguing with the imaginary white man, you know, or, or 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 we're not convinced that the Egyptians are black and that people of the ancient time basically all were from a modern Gentile perspective, black peoples. We're speaking about black peoples. They lied to us concerning the race of not just the Egyptians, but also the race and the grace of the Hebrews known as Israelites and falsely so-called Jews of today. But before we show you the evidence, let's start the story at the beginning. The biblical tale begins when the Hebrew patriarch Jacob escapes drought in the land of Canaan, modern Israel, and moves to the land of plenty the land of the pyramids, ancient Egypt. Okay, pause it right here. Um, when I watched this just recently before we started recording, I thought of something about Jacob. And we have a book coming forward. It is 
called the Children of the Ethiopians is based on the late Michael Murphy's uh, writings, and we give some annotation and you know some some commentary, brief commentary is given in in this first draft that's coming out. But definitely get a copy of it or go to Revelation two seven dot org and you can read his original draft of it. But we're publishing this for the for the disciples and for our study so that we can know what the truth about this is and debunk a lot of the 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 lies that are out there and a lot of the lies based on a misinterpretation it's really about the interpretation right as as the messiah says if you can see what is before you right if you truly can see what's before you then what's hidden right from you will become evident you know, the fact is that once you're giving a misinterpretation of what you're seeing, then it's all upside down, right? It's like the inverted pyramid. This is where Satanism comes in through a misinterpretation. We go back to Genesis and see what happened in the Ganetta Aden. Basically, man was made very good, right? And then he got tricked into a good and evil bargain. The only thing he gained by it was evil. It's not, well, why did God allow this to happen? Why did man not know himself? So from the very beginning, man did not wreck a chenu, as they said in ancient Egypt, he did not know himself. Now there's a wrong perspective of the Egyptians too. Yahweh says that Egypt is my people. These pyramids that you are seeing on the screen right here, it's very interesting because when we go to, um, when we go to, uh Isaiah chapter 19. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 19 for a moment. Are the pyramids in the Bible? We say yes. We say that the pyramids are in the Bible. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 19 and see what chapter 19 reads. It says, The burden of Egypt, of Gibbet, behold. The first God, Egziaviher, known to the Hebrews as Yahweh, he who be who he be, known to Rastafari as his divine majesty, rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Gibbets, Egypt. And the idols of Gibbets, of Egypt, shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Gibbets, the heart of Egypt, shall melt in the midst of it. Verse 2, and I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. Could this be black on black violence, right? Black on black crime right here, the Egyptians against the Egyptians. And they shall fight every one against his brother. What we see going on in this COINTEL pro consciousness, you know, the Kemetans, the black Egyptians, Kemetans fighting against the black Hebrews and the black Hebrews fighting against the the, those who are into Egypt and they both fighting against and being afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation. That's Isaiah chapter 20 right there. But we're in 19. And they shall fight everyone against his brother, against his wendem, and everyone against his neighbor, his balangera, right? City against city and kingdom against kingdom. Sounds like tribal war. Sounds like what's going on in Africa even to this very day. Verse 3, And the spirit of Gibbets of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof, the advice thereof. And we see that Egyptology, for a large part, is just coming out of this destruction as black people are beginning to Look at it with fresh eyes and from a fresh perspective, from the original context, because they are the people of this ancient civilization who really were there. The European, for the large part, was only there in the latter Greco-Roman period of time, right? But the people that were there were all the different tribes, including the native people, would be what we would call black peoples from a modern Gentile mind perspective. So they all were black, basically. But with speaking about our people, the Hebrews and Beta Israel and black Israel and Jah's people and God's people in the midst of all of these black people. See, 
a lot of the black scholars are looking at Egypt from Charleston Heston and from a, a, a post-traumatic slave master disorder. That's how they're looking at Egypt. So in a sense, there's some good in it that they begin to find something positive within those of their own kind, but then they turn around against the Bible and are not able to see the Bible in an equally black consciousness, right? Or from a black perspective, they still are seeing Charleston Heston and Cesar Borgias and, and, and the white, white supremacy, which is a deception of the devil. The devil really fooled the white people bad. I mean, black people, yeah, we know that. We can see all of our civilization and where we're at right now. But white supremacy don't recognize that they've been deceived by the deceiver, right? To believe that they are superior due to their lack of melanin, right? That's not even scientific as they're beginning to find out, as they begin to discover knowledge for themselves. We already knew this, but now that they're discovering it. But anyway, it says, and they shall seek to the idols and to the charmers and to them that have familiar spirits and to wizards. I see this going on in the black consciousness uh, community, right? And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord. Now, here's what's interesting. And he kind of makes this point as he goes further, saying that it was the rulers of the Egyptians. See, we're told that it was the Egyptians. And the Bible even reads that. But the context of it was the rulers because the Hebrews lived in Egypt and could pass for Egyptians. That means that they racially must be the same or have been similar to the Egyptians, which should just as one very major piece of evidence, just destroy everything of a white supremacist rhetoric and a Gentile mindedness. But here it says that the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord. Is this why we have the Egyptian pyramid incomplete on the back of the $1 bill? Is this the cruel Lord, the Lord of, of white supremacy, the new world order? so-called it's not new and it's not about order and a fierce king shall rule over them remember in don l's prophecy it speaks about a fierce king a king of a fierce countenance i've come to see that as being um white supremacy in the form of counterfeit antichrist jesus their whitewashed jesus caesar bogeas but, but but basically it's Caesar according to type and Czar, right? According to spirit. Now Czar in in Ethiopic, right? Czar from our own root is a demonic spirit. But this is what they call their rulers, Czars and Kaiser and Caesar, right? Then we have Caesar Bogiers and the Israelites denied and in spirit sought to murder the black lord right? Saying that they had no king but Caesar. I mean, think about this. The Almighty must have a sense of humor because they were talking about Caesar, the Roman, white, European, Roman ruler. And then in the latter days and times, as they return hither to this consciousness at the end time, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. So we need to have a correct context of what happened in the beginning based on the evidence we have. So a fierce king shall rule over them, saith, saith Yahweh, he who be who he be, saith Adonai Sebaot, Adonai, Ja, Rastafari. And the waters shall fail from the sea and the river shall be wasted and dried up. You know, they're talking about um, California, and the dry spell. Some talk about global warming. Some talk about climate change. It's really global harming, right? And it's really um, the climate is change. The climate has more to do with the state of the spiritual state of the people. We'll hopefully we'll address that particular subject matter as well. That was something the Holy Spirit showed. I and I want to teach you on that. That I heard some of the black teachers and some of our people teach that. Have you noticed whenever they do something to black people, there's always some natural, there used to be like natural disasters that would happen whenever they go against God's people. Now, we don't see the correspondence of these things when we hear about these things because we are distracted 
right, by the keys of this seclorum, the keys of this Gentile world system. And they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of the fence shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. This is what, why you see the picture of Egypt right there in, in modern day Egypt with those invader Arabs, Arabs and, and children of the Greeks, the Romans and all of the conquerors who rule modern Egypt and are considered politically white. If you look at the land, wherever they dwell is is, is dried up. It's, it's this very image that we see today. It's not like it was in ancient times. Structurally, basically, geographically, yes, but not in the blessed. So we see this as a prophecy that has come to pass, right? When the native people have been driven out and suppressed. The fishes also shall mourn and all they that cast angle into the brook shall lament and they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. You're not doing too well, those people. You know, we know how they really made their money and survived, those Arabs and the other invaders and conquerors. Right, heathen and Gentile conquerors by selling, by by tomb robbing and tomb raiding and, and 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 stealing and necromancy, right, and stealing our ancient legacy and of our people and ancient black peoples and selling them to the Gentiles around the world. But as the word says, that no weapon formed against I and I shall prosper. Right. And all things work toward the good of those who love our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are called according to his purpose. Rastafari. Moreover, they that work in fine flax and they that weave networks shall be confounded. They can't do what our ancient people did. The Arabs have been there for a long time and now they try to, you know, claim like this is our ancestors. We know it's a joke. We know it's a lie. You, you know what I mean? They cannot do, you know, what the ancients did. And they shall be broken in the purposes thereof, all that make sluices and ponds for fish. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise counsels of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say you to Pharaoh? I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Now we have to recall that in the time of Isaiah, right? If we really know history and put history in its proper context, Egypt for all intents and purposes was on the decline. Now notice this as well in the biblical prophecies of the end, when it talk about the kingdoms that are part of the Babylonian system, if you notice carefully, Egypt is not mentioned. In this very same chapter, chapter 19, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, will say that Egypt is my people, right? And what father would not chastise his own son or his children whom he loves, right? Where are they? Where are the wise men? And let them tell thee now and let them know what Yisrawit Gitai Gziavihir, what Adonai Sabaot hath purpose upon Egypt. So you read all these books about Egypt and each one contradict the next one. They, they, they're wise, they're intellectual, they have access first class to all of the evidence. You see, the evidence we have, we have to actually headrest with jaw on this evidence, but we don't have it first class. So some things we can only state within the context of what we actually have to refer to. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Nofar deceived. They have seduced Egypt. Now, someone being seduced, before they were seduced, right, they were probably in a better state, a more virtuous state. After someone is seduced, they kind of messed up, to put it politely. Even they that stay of the tribes thereof, and speaking of the native people, the native black peoples, right? Adonai hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof, as a drunken man staggereth in his own vomit. 
neither shall there be any work for Egypt. Since our ancestors, both the indigenous Ethiopian and black Africans and native Africans and the Africans who built that civilization and the Hebrews, right, the Afro-Shemites, since we all have been exiled from that land, if you notice, they, there hasn't been any work for them. They said that's the biggest problem in Egypt today. They don't got no work. They can't make any work. Well, if they be the ancestors of these people, surely they can do something, but they're not. They do lot, right? Um, so there's no work for Egypt, which head or tail branch or rush may do. In that day shall Egypt be like woman. We see this among the Arabs and what's going on in Egypt. They just complaining little bitches, basically. Oh, such and such. They got all the Arab oil money and all this. They can't get their act together, right? But they're considered to be white peoples. I want you to note that. And it politically, and it shall be afraid, uh, be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of Adonites of our old, Rastafari, which shaketh over it. And the land of Judah, prophetically we speak of Ethiopia when we speak of the land of Judah, right? Shall be a terror to Egypt, all that bad talk that Mubarak had against the Egypt, against the Ethiopians and the building of the dam and all of that. And we see who has been damned, right? The whole system has been turned upside down. Everyone that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the council. And we're reading the council of Adonai of our oath of Jah, Rastafari, which he hath determined against it. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan. Speak the language of Canaan. Now, this is very important. Five cities are going to speak the language of Canaan. Not the language of Ham or Kam, but the language of Canaan. We say those peoples over there, those so-called Arab peoples, are remnants, mixed, the lick, lick, mixed peoples, mixed remnants, but are Canaanites. Right? They are the Canaanites who have, as their Canaanitish fathers before, settled in our lands, North Africa, the Middle East, so-called, the Levant, and other places. Even if we push it, we can go all the way to, to ancient Babylon because the original peoples there were black people. This is how we get Abraham coming out from there and him being of the Ethiopic stock. But we'll touch on that as well. Swear... They say, and swear to Adonai Zabaot. One shall be called the city of destruction. Now, here's where I wanted to read up to for this portion right here. This is a little bit extended annotation, but hopefully Jah will reveal to you the wisdom of it. In that day, verse 19, shall there be an altar to Adonai. In the midst of the land of Egypt, you're looking at the altar, right, to Adonai, to the Hebrew God, the God of the Hebrews, of the Hebrews, as they were known in ancient Egypt, the, the Hebrews, the Kebre, right, or the Hebrews, the Hebher, the priest, right, the Shem priest, in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to Adonai, to Selassie. And you see these three pyramids. Well, there's four, but those are the queen's pyramids. The, the male pyramids are three, right? Um, and they have their companions, their consort. As the king of kings was crowned that day, so was uh, Queen Omega or, or Kedamawit Waleta Georgis. And it shall be, verse 20, for a sign and a witness. Now, here's what Tinbita Esaias, or the prophecy of Yeshayahu, the prophet Isaiah says, that this altar to Adonai, that's in the midst, right? The Giza, the Agazi, the Ge'ez, the Ethiopic, you see the connection right there. Or you should see it, if may, may Yeshua heal your blindness so you can see it, to the to Adonai in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border there of the border of what? Remember a couple of verses before I spoke about the land of Judah. After the lion of the tribe of Judah, they change it to the lion of Ethiopia. So th that's another prophetic 
connection right there. Um, verse 20. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness to Adonai and Sabaoth in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry to Adonai, to Jah, Rastafari, because of down presses. That's why even around the world, you can see them adopting, you know, the Rastafari, the uprising, you know, the music, the culture. They, 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 they haven't, they haven't fully received the good news because we, as this generation, haven't fully proclaimed the good news. Right. And he shall send them a savior and a great one and he shall deliver them. Verse 21. And Yahweh, he who be who he be, shall be known to Egypt and the Egyptians shall know Yahweh in that day and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow to Adonai and perform it. You can see them knotting up around the world. Rastafari. Right, that liberation from down pressure. And Adonai shall smite Egypt. What? Now you notice something here. It says that the Egyptians shall know who he is. They shall call upon him, but Egypt shall still be smitten. Now people say, well, how can this be so? How can this be so at the same time? Remember that many of those who came out with Moses and the Israelites, they were... Um, Egyptians, even the Israelites were considered Egyptian, but the Israelites, the Hebrews knew themselves, right? They identified themselves like we as black people or African people in the West. Yes, we're Africans. Yes, we, we're Ethiopians in that sense. But in the root, we are Beta Israel. We are Bane Israel. And this is what we have to know at the crux of the matter. As the Mal, as, as, uh, Peter Tosh and, and the whalers sung, the Israelites. Right, the Israelites and Yahweh shall smite Egypt because the Egypt here is your new world order, not your new world order. Hopefully, you don't take possession of it, but the new world order, Egypt. In fact, where is do I have a dollar on me? Does somebody have a dollar? I wanted to show you understand, I wanted to show this particular sign right here the Egypt. Yeah, the Egypt, right? The Egypt that shall be smitten right here. Here you go, right here. Notice how strange and interesting this is. Can you see it right there? Can you see it right there? What is that doing on this dollar? And why is that there? That symbol is there because of you people, because of we people, right? That symbol right there. Now that eye, right? That eye is not an Egyptian eye, right? But people believe, oh, that's the eye of Horus. No, that's the eye of Lucifer. It has nothing to do with our way. Just like the pyramid really has nothing to do with America besides we who are the Hebrews, right? The Hebrews in the America and the Exodus, the movement of Yahweh's people.